welcome back hello hello this is the future of photography i'm chris and as you can see there's um jeremiah adrian and no emar <laughs> no sad sad yeah she's napping she's not, <laughs> she didn't want to talk to us um <laughs> <laughs> that's a little unfair. I Hi, think she's Mar just super, super exhausted from all the stuff that's going on I in think Ireland. That might be part of it. So um, everyone's exhausted right now. I think we, we yeah. can't blame anyone for uh, for being a bit under the weather. So um, it's just the three of us. And as we do, when Imar says I'm not going to make it, we choose tech to talk about so <laughs> yeah so so today uh, it's us um everyone uh, brought um, a, a technical technology related topic to the table and that's what we want to talk about so let's see and then follow that with picks of the week so it's pretty much like everyone has a big pick and a small pick sort of thing so uh, how about we start with Jeremiah? Your turn, sir. Well, yeah, I, I thought that uh, I, I would really have a conversation about uh, the history of technology um, and the the kind of evolution of of innovation in photography, um, starting with the camera obscura, which you may or may <laughs> not know. Um, is uh has been used since the fifth century bc pretty is it that long that's long, i'm not yes. sure i did know that actually yeah yeah um obviously it wasn't film or anything like that but but uh m you know uh images through small uh pinholes uh projected on walls probably came about quite by accident or naturally and people saw them and i'm sure that there, it was inspiring to several artists and whatnot. But um, have so you that, ever you tried know, this back home to darken a room and put a put a hole in the window, just a foil? Uh, I, a foil? You know, I haven't. I have never done this. I always wanted to do this because people tell me how how amazing an experience that is to sit in a room that is a camera. Well, curiously, um, not a mile from where I live, right on the. Um, on the kind of bluffs, there is a room in Santa Monica uh, called the Camera Obscura. And it, it's generally along a walking path and it is um, you know, effectively a tourist place, but it's pointed out um, into the ocean. And you could just enter this room. It's about maybe 20 by 20 uh, feet. And um, it's a camera obscura. And you could see the ocean and the clouds and everything like that right there. So though I haven't done it, I, I, uh, I've seen it. The other thing is there's uh, an artist, and maybe we could uh, dedicate uh, an episode to the camera obscura in all of its kind of uh, innovations. There's some artists working with that right now, uh, one of whom is is a very good friend of a friend. I'm blanking on his name. That's why I want to push it off to another episode. <laughs> but um, his work is quite great. He's out of Georgia. Um, you know, then you, you have centuries and centuries and centuries move along until photochemistry. And in the 18th and 19th century, you know, we have photochemicals. And, and that starts to develop a sense of, well, can we capture what's on the wall? Pretty interesting. And that gives way to the daguerreotype and the calotype and the collodion process and dry plates and then roll film, kind of mid, uh, I guess, you know, uh, end of the 19th century. And then autochrome. And eventually, you know, we get into digital. All of these things, uh, I, I bring them up because I always think, uh, certainly for my own work, is connecting with the aesthetics rather than the t technique of the past uh, somehow give us a, a, an entry point to the feeling, the emotional feeling of how an image captures memory. And I'm, I'm fascinated by this. And so, uh, you know, a lot of my work, as you may know, um, uh, is moving towards a, a emu, you know, emulation of, of some of these techniques um, in order to kind of fulfill the emotional connection we have to the past. So uh, I'm using, the, I would consider, very advanced um, digital techniques 
to capture aesthetics of previous techniques. Um, all along the way, uh, the bottom line becomes about our emotional connection to the image. So any innovation uh, belies that. that. If you remember the, you know, as we get into digital and the big argument between clean, uh, perfect, sharp versus impressionism in imagery, um, what is the difference in emotional response? And we uh, in the film business have always discussed, you know, graininess and and uh, uh, sort of a, a, a narrow focus that kind of more impressionistic uh, tends to be warmer. Uh, maybe it's because of the history we have with these things. Maybe it's just a natural way our brain processes information. But I, I suspect it's the same argument of vinyl versus digital and the warmth of vinyl and the kind of coolness of digital. Um, so I think as we try to innovate technically, we also have to innovate aesthetically. And that's my little blurb for this morning. Only you, Jeremiah, could bring a, a history lesson to our tech <laughs> future. show. <laughs> to, <laughs> tech to, week, the yeah. <laughs> to the future. <laughs> I go back to the history of the past. I mean, because I I mean we, we've made this connection so many times here before, how uh, inevitably linked the future of photography is with the history of photography. So um, <laughs> thanks thanks for keeping that, that link uh, going. <laughs> keeping us honest, yeah, th really. Yes. I think there's an app for that, though, Jeremiah, to be fair, these days. <laughs> <laughs> but, but by the way, but if you really want me to kind of go full on innovation or tech, I could go, well, there is a Fuji uh, camera. Uh, it, it is a brand new, I guess you'd call it a, a CCTV camera with a 40 times zoom, absolutely sharp. And, and as we've discussed in the past, is that a good innovation or not? I mean, you can imagine when it becomes almost satellite in terms of <laughs> focus. So you can read the manufacturer of a button man, you know, uh, who made the button on a coat from, you know, 400 yards away. And we sweep our world with these kinds of cameras. Is that positive or negative? So that's... Uh, mm. I put that in my little, um, those will be in the show notes too, that not my commentary, but the camera itself. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm going to pick up that second spot. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a thing that went through the photography blogs um, just within the last week, I think. Um, and it is NVIDIA. NVIDIA being, well, traditionally being the company that uh, made graphics hardware, but now they have really added the whole artificial intelligence machine learning slant to that um, because that traditionally is done on graphics processors because they are ma pretty much made for that. So NVIDIA has also done a lot of research in the whole field of um, computational photography. And one of the things that they've just proposed, which I find really interesting, is um, let me bring this up here and um, just play this video while we talk. Uh, the Ooh. thing that they propose is that they want to revolutionize, in air quotes, um, video conferencing. So you, you and I, I mean, that's exactly what we're doing right now, but we are sending pictures, like 30 pictures a second over over that wire okay and that takes bandwidth that takes uh, some bandwidth um, there is some compression algorithms in there so-called codecs that squeeze it a bit but still bits have to go through that pix pixels have to go through the whole um, internet to make this possible what nvidia now does is um, they have they they make this into uh, an ai supported procedure as there will be keyframes like individual pictures but not all the time not 30 times a second but every i don't even know every minute maybe and they will detect and send the motion data of a face over and then on the other side that gets reconstructed by an ai into the person's face again so that's Ooh, okay, I don't understand. I, 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 I'm tempted to let you finish, but hang, is, is, 
That that sounds a bit odd, doesn't it? So, <laughs> go on. Anyway, go on. So I I think it's it's a it's a form of very advanced puppeteering. Like imagine you have a still photo of a face, and then you manipulate it. Like you 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 take you take the 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 edges of the mouth and open up and move that. Um, so what you see is on in this video you, is is exactly what they do. You have the video version, the AI version. Um, on the right hand side usually when they do a comparison and the well comparable video on the other side um, that that would be regular video what that means is that they reduce the amount of data by i believe a factor of 10 and it's still and therefore the amount of truth in the image <laughs> that is my question of course because i mean they can now of course um, also put in other targets like a, a puppet or something and animate that yeah and if they have that adobe software that can generate people's voices well you know that the one they showcased about yeah. a couple of years ago where where you feed it 60 minutes of somebody's voice and then you can basically recreate deep deep fake somebody's yeah. voice is yeah. it is it cool? That, this is great because it means that I don't actually ever have to work anymore, right? All I need to do <laughs> is to to spend a little bit of time with the AI engine and uh, get it to uh, utter some meaningless business jargon, and um, I can kick back and relax. <laughs> I mean, of course, it it brings up the question how real uh, how real is what comes out on the other side? And well, is it is it like I'm putting an MP3 to a musician who spent? hours uh, working on the nuances i mean the, the a... target the target for this is video conferencing like people talking to each other talking heads i think is the main application for this right now and the results look quite convincing in the video that they share so we'll, we'll put them in the show notes everyone can make the can make up their own mind about this but the question <laughs> is no, I, I think I think we have to put this in a context of what's happening in cameras right now anyway, and that's a lot of computation goes on in cameras. So So theoretically yes. a camera could break down your face completely into its components, mm -hmm. color, texture, you know, uh structure. Wireframe. <laughs> things, all of that. Yeah. Generate that through just bits, you know, could be certainly just in kilobytes that information yeah. goes, boom. And then reconstruct it, uh, which is effectively an animation of your face, mm -hmm. but it looks absolutely real. Mm -hmm. isn't uh, that what, so that's what a lot of video codecs do already, though, isn't it? No. Because <clears throat> very, very rarely, I mean, you know, do, do people shoot video all eye, you know, where, where every single True. frame is complete. Most video is shot long up, isn't it? Where actually what you're doing is you're taking a full frame every certain so number of frames frame. or so. Uh, and you're only tracking the deltas. You only, you only it's not send making whatever stuff up, has then, changed it? Yeah, between the last it's, frame. Yeah, it's not making it that up, though, is it? It's it's actually measuring the deltas, and it's just a way of compressing the data feed, I suppose. So maybe it is a bit different from that. Well, could you imagine then uh, sending a large format image of uh, an environment which is broken down by the same, just a still image? which is broken down, you know, a, a massive file broken down into AI, which NVIDIA does since the, the, they're the, one of the engines of uh, certainly of game uh, machines, which, you know, very effective in Unreal and, and et cetera. Um, and, and use this very same technology to reconstruct it on the end. So I can basically send you massive uh, visual files that are reconstructed so they appear to be they're not but they appear to be um totally a representation of what i've shot theoretically right yeah mm. so so what does that mean for the future for <laughs> i was gonna <laughs> say what does that mean to me <laughs> well so we have been through it was it earlier this year we went through this thing where apple said that on facetime they were going to correct your eyes which it never so did. you could look at you could look at the screen they never made it and, in and it would make it look as if you were looking into the camera and they never did yeah. exactly right Chris because there was a bit of an outcry wasn't there um, people didn't like the idea that their eyes after which after all are the windows to the soul <laughs> are, are are being 
uh, played around are with. They, so are they if you if they are just like four pixels on a on a screen stamp sized as we are inside our little bubbles here? Are they still well, the eyes to the, soul, the the window to the soul? I grew. Up, I, I'm a member of the eight bit generation, Chris. <laughs> so I'm perfectly happy with that. You know? <laughs> I, I I see an innovation that could come out of it. Where whereas, uh, let's just say that I snap a little picture on my iPhone that is say 500 kilobytes, uh, and I want to print this as a large format image would be printed. You know, a Gursky. Uh, and <laughs> as well, you do, uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, the the AI could effectively take that and reconstruct it every every pixel um, into what effectively becomes a you know massive file uh, and massive DPI that could be output of incredible I, I yesterday was using the topaz uh, software that I did something very similar I had snapped a little image, which I'll, I'll put on our Discord later. Uh, it's just somebody had hung some Halloween uh, skeletons on their on their wall. I was walking, and one of them had crashed the sidewalk and <laughs> was just <laughs> lying there. A, a, you know, miniature skeleton. I thought, oh, there goes America. Perfect <laughs> metaphor right now <laughs> of how I feel. And 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 and, and oh, so yeah. I I just took a little okay. snap, and when I I got got back, I just loaded it up. Uh, and uh, obviously, when I kind of blew it up screen size, not even, you know, I could start to see the pixelation. I ran it through the AI of Topaz, which just came out with a, a an update, and it mm. was really, really good. So, uh, so, so they upsize a photo and they invent data. Well, they don't invent it. They, well, yes, they do artificially they do invent uh, it, sure. ML machine learning. Now, of course, I mean this this whole video co conferencing thing. Um, will have a massive, massively positive side effect if everyone gets to use these kinds of algorithms in the future. Because, um, I mean, j just us getting this show together, recording over the ocean and trying to keep the bit rates low enough so we don't get like um, d dropouts in the in the audio or in the video. Uh, everything takes a lot of bandwidth and uh, just imagine you could do a video conference where you have the the face of the other person in front of you and you are on that desert island with uh, only an edge connection and it still works mm -hmm. as uh, if the person was almost there i mean we're we're we really have this these two sides to it right the one side is does it really bother me that i know that it's not real because it looks real it talks real it feels real so doesn't bother me but, but at least you know the the, the 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 societal challenge perhaps is when people no longer remember that that is the case or, or never knew in the first place and and then you have potential for manipulation but if people know that people if take... people grow up with that um they will never assume it's real right so, I don't know. I, I disagree. No, I mean, look at, the, maybe. look at the there's, you know, this movement in, in uh, Japanese pop of these kind of AI generated the holograms. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Or, or, or even these, these kind of animated uh, singers that have become, you know, full personalities and they have a complete life online and, you know, customer base and all the rest of it yeah there's a, a, ikea even have one don't they? Mm. they there was a thing a story i saw recently about an ikea uh, model digital lived avatar in an IKEA flat for yep. a while but it actually wasn't a real person the the model was, was a, a digital avatar yeah I, th I think if it strikes a chord with you emotionally and you can relate to it uh, for uh, most humans they they won't care that much i believe that we will um, see new generations grow up that are way more fluidly interacting with uh, these things being real, Agreed. being not real, being virtual, being modified, being... Won't matter. Yeah, won't matter to them whatsoever because everyone does it and everyone knows and it will be 
Mm. Normal, See, and we'll probably not be around when that is. That's a, a positive look. But I said two things for me. One is I now have Whitney Houston in my head saying, "I believe that children <laughs> are the future. <laughs> teach, teach them well, and let them lead the way." And but it's the but but I also I I I, I think I, I flip the other way sometimes, uh, Chris, and I think actually maybe if people don't know, people don't assume it's not real. I think people will just take it for granted, and it will become perceived as real. But hey, you know that's that's me, you know, Mister Dystopia. Okay. By the way, isn't that? By the way, is that not the nature of the photographic image in and of itself, uh, where we look at an image? And again, yeah, I'm referring back to my own work. Absolutely where brilliant. Well done, Jeremy. That exactly uh, proves my point. An illusion, a black and white. Let's just say, um, this is not a real representation of how we see reality, and yet we ascribe reality to those images just based on culture uh our history with those mm -hmm. images what you know what we've learned to interpret so um all of photography and art is really an illusion that is projected uh on the technical side one more little point um going back to the ai of it if for example i had a uh a 3D picture, not even a 3D, a 360 picture of you, Chris, on my phone that would allow uh, NVIDIA to reconstruct it really quickly because it had already on the, on the um, not on the kind of uh, host, but on the, the, you know, the user base. So it could reconstruct your face rather quickly. That even would be a even more innovative way to go. And then you could project me onto your table and i'd be princess leia saying there you go which is my us. hope <laughs> okay adrian what is your tech that topic? brings up mental images i really don't want to think about just now <laughs> thanks Chris. See, see, see my headphones it's almost like okay um <laughs> let's let's go with you adrian your tech Topic. Okay, so so here's a, a real world uh, techie update. So I got a new camera yesterday. Yay! Uh, yay! Always nice to get a new camera, um, uh, especially in a year when I have sold way more cameras than I've bought. But that's a that that is a good thing, and that was on purpose. But so uh, actually, and I should say it's new to me because it's not new. Uh, for the first time ever, I think I've bought a used digital camera. Uh, I have upgraded my Fuji X-T1, which had, uh, which had done me really good service for five years at least, uh, to a Fuji X-T3. Mm -mm. And uh, it's beautiful, actually. It is, it, whilst it is used, it is, as they say, like new. Anyway, uh, for those watching this on uh, YouTube, uh, this is the camera that I am using today to film the video uh, part of this uh, podcast. Um, so... Why, how, what, uh, well, the why bit of it is that um, I'm now doing uh, way more video conferencing and uh, I'm, uh, as, as I get sick and tired of audio, but I fixed that years ago because we were doing podcasting for years, I've now got sick and tired of webcams in rubbishy, rubbishy webcams in laptops. So I thought uh, I could do something about that, couldn't I? Because I know how to do camera stuff. <laughs> Jeremiah, are you, are you hinting at your own camera there? <laughs> Currently. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on it. And uh, so, I mean, because I have all Fuji kit anyway, I've got the lenses. So all I did is just use, uh, actually, it, I used a company that was my pick of the week last week, uh, the MPB, uh, to, to, to trade up to an X-T3, which is now fantastic and is now filming me. And I have one cord, uh, a USB cord that powers the camera and takes a video feed from it, which I can feed, uh, well, firstly, across the web to Germany, to Chris, who then mingles it into the mm -hmm. bubbles and then sends it back out to all of us. And you look brilliant. Looks really well, good. Well, uh, thank you very you much. Have, you have you. actual bokeh there, which... I do, Jim yeah. Which Jeremiah have, and, doesn't. <laughs> and and do you know what? I've actually even left the camera uh, on uh, auto because I'm taking the feed from the live preview, so it's uh, or live view, as they say. Uh, so, so it's all a bit. Um, uh, it, it's all. It's not so much a, a feature of the the settings of the camera itself. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, um, uh, so I'm really pleased about this. And then, of course, this is a real world lesson of the future of photography. Um, 
I have a camera now that will be used for three or four hours a day some days uh, where instead of just sitting in the drawer until I can get to it at the weekend. So it's, you know, in, in that sense, it's going to get used more, which is great. I'm going to get you know, uh, to learn some more about using cameras, which is also great. And I was really, really pleased with myself until I logged on to record this and, and, and Chris just <laughs> shot me down completely. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. So, so I would I would be actually... Um, uh, interested in how many of our listeners or viewers uh, have have turned over to using their photography cameras as web conferencing cameras and video cameras that they uh, use mm. every day now because I mean this whole video this links it to the Nvidia thing this whole uh, video conferencing thing is here to stay and um, the future is people want better cameras because they get fed up with their tiny webcams in their laptops that um, especially as other people start upgrading and I can already see a bit of envy in Jeremiah's face um, <laughs> so well do you know Dot this is a future of photography isn't it that is what we're called and that is what we're here yeah. and actually you know um, uh, you know, I, I often joke that the future of photography is is with teenagers using their phones. It's got nothing to do with us grown ups, and there is definitely an element of that. But actually, the way us grown ups use cameras is going through somewhat of a revolution itself, isn't it? Uh, with all of, you know, and I, I suppose this is a little bit biased to uh, what you might call office workers who are now newly working from home, which which is a category I fall right into. Uh, but I, I now uh, am using a camera to talk to my professional colleagues uh, a lot of the time. And, uh, you know, there's, there's articles, of course, and, and YouTube channels that say, oh, you've got to look as professional as you can. But at some point, I'm going to have to do a job interview down a video line. I've run a few where I've been the interviewer this year. And at some point, and and actually, if you're going to try and do, you know, be competitive in in bidding for work or or in in an actual you know, permanent job interview, you're going to have to get used to this stuff. And there's a whole tranche of people who whose professional careers are going to be impacted by this. So I think this is genuinely uh, a part of the future of photography right, right now. I think that's a excellent point. Is that if you are kind of pitching something, whether it's yourself or an idea it, within a uh, the context of a uh, of online video call, uh, the impression that the host, i.e. the interviewee, uh, will get, even if nothing is said, and even if they their brain understands limits of bandwidth, uh, technological limitations of your camera, etc., still compared to somebody with great bandwidth, sharp, beautifully lit and great sound quality will give them an edge. There's no doubt because it's the McLuhan as the medium is the message here. And, and uh, yeah. I think we can't yeah. overlook that. So I think I think you're right about the bandwidth thing. Um, I mean, that, uh, and you can't help that. Uh, but what you can do is you can make sure you sound good and you make, can make sure you're lit well. Um, and, and that includes, you know, not having half your face just washed out to some sort of yellowy white because you happen to be sat beside a window and the sun's just look, look out. us yeah. going all smug now that he has a better <laughs> camera. I'm not smug. No, no, this is definitely not smugness. This I'm is definitely. Kidding. Yeah, I, I know. It's all right. Well, don't mind. But it, it, it's the, this is this is something that I'm going through right now. Um, and, and I've managed to get through most of, of 2020 without having to do a lot of video conferencing, but I've just changed uh, the client project that I'm working on. And I've, and I'm have now in an environment where there is a lot of video, where I was, it was mostly audio previously. So I am a bit late to the game here, but I thought, well, you know, what am I learning? And Chris, I'd like to talk if, uh, as well about um, uh, the frame rate thing that, that you were talking to me about before we, we hit record, because mm -hmm. there's a good lesson in there for people looking at this, I think. Um, because I, I'm now using, because uh, Fuji have released an app to turn your Fuji X camera into a webcam, I'm using that right now. And I thought I was doing really well because I have one oh, cable just you to, are doing, to program. You are doing but really you, well. You, you suggested, though, Chris, that the the frame rate might be a bit well, low. Is that it, Here's the thing. And <clears throat> all, all companies have done this now, Olympus and Canon and Nikon and so on. They have all released these virtual webcam drivers where you can now hook up your big camera and uh, be it a DSLR or a, or a mirrorless camera and you can hook it up to your computer using USB 
And then on the computer is a piece of software that turns that into a webcam. And now your Zoom and your uh, Skype and so on can see that camera and um, use it as a webcam, which is amazing because now you are looking through a sensor that is so much bigger than the one that is in your tiny little webcam that might be in your laptop. So mm. <clears throat> that is an advantage and we can see it at your picture. Let me let me make you bigger here. Just the bokeh, just the way the background drops out of focus. That's a function of the sensor now with smartphones that's changing that equation is changing but in general that's what it does and yeah of course bigger pixels better light consumption and so on but the problem is these cameras have never been or the camera's usb output has never been designed to do that so what these cameras have is they have a live view that you can get out through the usb port that is usually used for tethered shooting like in a studio situation you have an mm -hmm. external monitor you see a preview but that preview isn't at the best quality that the camera can deliver. It is fairly good, but uh, the bandwidth and uh, the whole way these cameras are designed will often not give you the full frame rate. And we're talking 30 or 60 frames a second. Um, and yeah, because I think the viewfinder on on this camera is at least 60 hertz. Yeah, 60 frames per probably second. Probably is, but the rate. question is what USB connection is that? Is that the USB 2 connection? That might have limitations there. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's USB-C. Okay, um, but again... The, Although it's going into a 2013 MacBook. so Which might be a end? factor in that. There is a transmission yeah. line here. Um, the thing is, the, the best quality you can get out of these cameras is by... Um, using their HDMI output, setting them, if they can, to a mode that is called clean HDMI, where you don't have any screen elements, any battery symbols and stuff on your screen um, on the HDMI. Mm -hmm. And that will typically output the full frame rate at really good quality and at uh, best resolution. And with most cameras, that would be... Probably what we need here is 1080p full HD. We're not even yeah, talking. Yeah, I don't 4K, think you. Are, I don't right? think there's not much point in filming me in 4K because I'm not going to send 4K down the internet anyway. This so. is as big as your bubble gets, and that is that's <laughs> even fine with uh, look at me go, yeah, like, 720p, I'm right? <laughs> so it's it's it, yeah we we but 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 the but still I mean the 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 output you get through the USB is still tons better than any webcam on the market right now. Yeah, and for me, it's the difference is is in the is in the lighting. I mean, I can't do much about the composition. It's going to be my face, right? So, so it's like you you got to take that as it comes. Uh, but the the uh, the the quality uh, or the, of the tone based upon the lighting and how the sensor reacts to the mm -hmm. different shades is 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 enormously better. And I think I'd probably take fifteen frames a second with the good tone over you know 30 frames a second that just oh, looks horrendous you have done a, such a massive step forward just by doing mm. that by using that i think camera, it's yes. yeah but i think for any of our listeners who were going through this or thinking of going through this i think that that was a point i hadn't even considered i had just assumed that the refresh rate would be you know down the cable into my camera would be sufficient now i'd like to drink i'd like to just do one other thing before we start um, which is simply about um powering your camera so if anybody's thinking of doing this, uh, either investing in a new camera like I've done uh, uh, or, or trying to use your existing camera, uh, making sure that you can power the camera and it doesn't go off in the middle of a crucial, a crucial pitch <laughs> uh, is quite something. So yeah. one of the reasons I chose the X-T3 rather than some other cameras I could have chosen uh, is that you can power it with USB-C and it will stay on it or work while it's charging. Mm. A lot of cameras, some of the older ones, uh, will charge through USB, but they won't actually work at the same time. It's charge or use. Uh, so you want to check out the power uh, settings as well. Yeah, there's also these so-called fake batteries or battery couplers that will act like a battery but the cable comes out and goes into a power yes. supply so there's different yeah. ways to do that but mm. again a the bigger bigger sensors we have talked about that here before sensor size does matter for these things well the gauntlet has certainly been thrown down to me i feel <laughs> <laughs> so um, um by Stay the way tuned. a very simple thing if you if you want to get hdmi out and there are these little converters like the elgato cam link this 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 is what this is what they look like it's a little like a 
It's like a memory looks stick. Looks like a memory right? stick. Like a slightly yeah. large memory stick. Exactly, and it has a USB on one side, and then on the other side there is HDMI. Um, and those things, they will, if you even can get them, because right now everyone wants these things, um, will set you back 130 bucks or something. So the Elgato ones are difficult to come by, but I've looked on Amazon and there are many, many... Uh, There's really cheap. In the 20, in the 20, 20 euros, yep. dollars, pounds range, uh, which do exactly the same job. I'm I'm just looking around. I I had one. I don't have it handy at the moment, but um, I got one for 19 euros, um, which yeah. is a. I think some of them, some of the cheaper ones, are not so good on frame rate or resolution. You know, but this is we're not talking about DA converters here, where you re, you need something that's going to work. This is not like a mic preamp or or, or something like they that. They get yeah, 30 frames. They get full HD 30 frames um, a second through. A uh, USB two port, which is plenty good. So which is plenty, yes. Yeah. yeah so absolutely. and even the cheap ones, they might not have like one hundred percent image quality, maybe only ninety five percent, but still um, worth checking out. So with that said, let's go to the picks of the week. Let's stick with you, Adrian. While you're here. Okay, I, I have two. I've added one, actually, as we've been speaking, oh. because the conversation reminded me of, of something. So my first pick uh, is is to is to use your good camera uh, as a webcam, uh, especially if you're you're working uh, in environments where you need to impress people for one, one reason or another. <laughs> or also just to stop yourself going nuts from looking at the, you know, the picture of yourself and looking at really horrible. Uh, so that's my first one. Uh, my second one is a, a callback... Uh, to what we were talking about earlier about NVIDIA making stuff up. And this is just a bit of fun. This is a YouTube channel I love. It's called <laughs> Bad Lip Reading. <laughs> I don't know if you two know I'm this one. I'm totally aware of it and I know most of the videos. <laughs> yes. uh, okay, I thought you might. I don't know, Jeremiah, if you know this uh, one. This I one. don't, but now uh, you've killed many hours of my life. It is so okay. much fun. It is so much fun. So it, they, they take... They take uh, scenes from TV, scenes from movies, whatever it might be, and and they overdub them, but they overdub them with their own scripts. Uh, so it's called bad lip reading because they make humorous scripts. And they are often in perfect quite lip satirical. Sync. In perfect in, lip sync. But they sync. do it. It's very, very, oh, it is. It's very, very clever. Yes, it, it, it is. It is almost like they were lip reading and they were the, uh, the they were the no, translators, not the right word, is it, if you're doing it in your same language, but uh, um it is very clever. Have, have a look at it. You're gonna, um, you're gonna have it tears is in your eyes from laughing. It's... It is definitely something that you could imagine Nvidia and Adobe collaborating on, because in the future when M Nvidia are taking and they're able to make your mouth move, and Adobe can <laughs> simulate your voice, uh, you know, all hell's gonna break loose. Quite frankly, <laughs> just, just from uh, artificial intelligence supported lip reading. <laughs> Well, maybe people could uh, uh, hire out themselves to be very impressive uh, online uh, interviewees and personalities. You just give them the <laughs> script and they, they will run the visuals and the audio. And there you go. You could just remotely hire them by the hour. Yeah, could do. All right, Jeremiah, here is uh, yours. My yeah, I, I, I thought I would uh, take a tack on something that probably could be the subject of a whole show, which is copyright and how to track back. And in the world of Instagram, Facebook, uh, TikTok, etc., cetera, um, the kind of grabbing or screen grabbing of shots and reuse for commercial purposes or otherwise without the permission of a photographer creator can be problematic, uh, especially to individuals who may not have the muscular uh, financial power to bring every of these people to court uh, and ascribe a value. Uh, Adobe, I know there's many different fo focuses, foci on, on how to authenticate photographs in the XML files. And uh, Adobe uh, wants to, or is in the process of building something so that you can put a lot of that information in permanently uh, that will be difficult uh, to strip out, though I'm sure possible, um, and uh, allow users, I mean, in an ideal world, you'd be able to look at a photograph, open up the XML, find out who who actually owns it, if it is licensable, licensable 
uh, where to do it, how to do it, and how much it would cost. That would be a very, very good thing for commercial photographers or artists. Uh, so I think any way um, to embed what you need to embed within an image uh, is something that I think we're going to see a lot more of. Okay. And in the meanwhile, I had a change in camera because my my externally powered DSLR that I'm looking at has just stopped working <laughs> for some oh. reason. Oh, you dear. did not follow the guidelines. No, it, 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 felt, it, felt, it, it had a power. It had a definitely a power problem. So anyway, so this is what the webcam looks like in comparison. Um, OK, my pick of the week is um, this one, a light meter. And uh, this is on Kickstarter right now. And full disclosure, I know the guy, just very remotely know the guy who uh, builds this. So a light meter is built into cameras, but with older cameras, with film cameras, um, there's a good chance the light meter won't uh, be in there. And then you could use your smartphone. You have to take it out of the pocket and use an app or, or you use um a custom built light meter and you can get some of those used there's like the gossen light meter is very popular because they are they've been produced in the hundreds of thousands i guess um and lots of people use them um but what uh, this guy does is and and he approached me a couple of years ago when he started developing this um and he approached me and, cho and showed me his idea and uh asked me a few questions so i gave my input and that's a that's the extent of my involvement. But um, when he now finished it, he just started his Kickstarter. It's already funded, so um, and uh, he 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 sent me one to evaluate. So I I have one here. I have um, let me just uh, show you this little thing. So here is the light meter um, in action. It's tiny. It's uh, this is a prototype. It's like a small matchbox. It's smaller it looks like than it's that. about what four centimeters by two centimeters by one centimeter. I mean, here, here, here's my hand and here's the little thing. So yeah, you, well, well within the palm of your hand. It, yeah, it's can really I, tiny. Can and I it, ask you, you sure. both a question which has directly uh, to do with uh, a reflected light meter mm -hmm. uh, that you're holding, which looks absolutely beautiful. However, it does, doesn't it? I thought that, yeah. Uh, I, I would say that uh, in my world, um, and I, I have a feeling that I share this, that if you know what your film speed are and you have a general understanding of, of light, i.e., you know, sunny 16, Adrian. Um, no, indeed, yeah. You know, cloudy 8, uh, you know, overcast 5, 6, etc. You know, setting the speed at the uh, ISO, uh, the camera speed, the ISO number, roughly, that with the films of today, do you really need a reflected light meter? That that's that's a, a open question for you. It's it's a good que It's a good question. I mean, the the modern film is is so tolerant, isn't it? Um, uh, yeah, that that you can almost bend it every which way. I think, though, especially you know, something like this is going to be. Uh, interesting to people with older cameras or, or toy cameras that don't have built-in meters because if you've got a built-in meter then you, d you don't really need a, an extra one do you so and, and those people are often not looking for a, a perfectly exposed aesthetic I mean this this I mean you, you could you could use the sunny 16 rule and just go with that as long as you shoot outside that is almost always going to be good especially if you use yeah. like color negative film this one this this thing goes down to like several minutes of exposure i don't know how precise yeah. it is but it it has a different range um and i think that's what's interesting um i uh, yeah you see I, i've never got to the point where uh, uh, you know shoot, shooting film i've always i've always preferred cameras that have reasonably reliable light meters built into them but even with things like uh, well and when with yeah on the other end with something like a holger um you, you you don't have a great deal of choice anyway yep. it's just like well is it is it is it sunny or cloudy right okay i'll choose that one then yeah but the so you you have to rely on it i th I think though there is there are definitely a bunch of people out there who are who are coming back to film or shooting film for the first time who may have got themselves a camera where the the light meter doesn't work or it never had one but haven't had the the practice over years to be able to judge these things 
And I think there's a real, you know, for something, I think there's a real opportunity for something like this to be interesting to, to those people, uh, the less experienced photographers who, who are trying things out. And, and of course, with film, I remember when I went back to film, uh, I, the first few roles were, were in some ways quite disappointing um, yeah, because of my lack of knowledge uh, and, and not exposing them correctly, perhaps, or whatever it might be. Um, so although modern films are very, very uh, tolerant of my personal mistakes, <laughs> um, I, I, th I think this could be really good. And as you said yourself, Jeremiah, it does look really nice. It's a quite smart little unit, isn't it? A little um, you know, silver metal that will go with any camera that's got sort of silver metal on it, really. It also comes in black. So oh, even better. Yeah. Okay. Simple operation I would say, feels valuable. I would say that if I was to offer uh, this developer uh, any advice, I would say for version two, should this be a success, this format, which is fantastic, should have a little tiny hole and be made as a spot meter. Because that would be valuable. I'm I'm pretty <laughs> sure that that is somewhere in the future, and um, th there's even an Easter egg on it. You can play pong on it. Now show me any other <laughs> really? light meter that you can do that on. Uh, I do you know what? It's never occurred to me to want to play pong on a light meter. But there you go. There you go. You're bored. You're out there. You're doing <laughs> astrophotography at night. You take like ten minute exposures. You need to pass the time somehow. Anyway, that's anyway. it for today. I <laughs> think we have this episode in the can. Of course, um, we'll be back with Imar. She will. She will be back. And um, we are on thefutureofphotography.com. That's our main location of course we're on twitter and on insta as well under tfob now and um join our discord tfttf.com slash join tfob uh, if you're watching this it's on the screen no over there if you're listening to this just go to the show notes and click the according link until then we'll be back in about a week from now until then take care bye-bye okay take care folks bye-bye